In the early 20th century, Latin America was aflame with aesthetic fervor. Passions ran high. Modernismo corralled the artistic energies of Europe into a new and wholly original approach to literature. The avant-garde pitched all-out warfare against traditional artistic forms and modes of expression. And these movements only gathered momentum in the years that followed, fanned by the flames of political turmoil that erupted throughout the continent. In Mexico, the government of Porfirio Diaz succumbed to a massive popular insurrection, giving rise to one of the most influential genres on the continent, the revolutionary novel. Later in the 1930s, the Argentinian intelligentsia joined up with factions from the military to stage a coup. Yet the imposition of a conservative regime only intensified artistic activity in that country. Similarly, an entire generation of Cuban writers, including the great Alejo Carpentier, were oppressed and often imprisoned for their opposition to the dictatorship of Geraldo Machado. This period of tumult and change fostered the development of authors who were to become icons of the major international episodes of this era. The Spanish Civil War, the Stalinist dictatorship, and the Second World War that was looming on the horizon. As a result of chronic social instability, writers were often used as political footballs and their status was in a constant state of flux. Many went into exile, voluntary or not, from their mother countries. This migration led to a cross-fertilization of styles and sensibilities that greatly diversified the literature of Latin America. The dislocation of authors such as Alfonso Reyes in Mexico and José Ortega y Gasset in Argentina was a crucial factor in their development as writers. Reyes tapped into his experience as an exile to create a text that masterfully revisioned the way Latin American history was to be interpreted. Vision of Anahuac Our nature has two opposite aspects. One, the highly praised virgin forest of America, is hardly worthy of description. An obligatory topic of admiration in the old world, it inspires the verbal enthusiasms of Chateaubriand. A life-giving oven where energies seem to be wasted with profligate generosity, where our spirit is marooned in intoxicating emanations, it is an exaltation of life and simultaneously an image of vital anarchy. Ours, that of Anahuac, is something better and more tonic. At least for those who like to keep their will alert at all times and their thoughts clear. The most fitting vision of our nature is in the central Mesa regions. There the vegetation is timid and heraldic, the countryside organized, the atmosphere one of excessive spotlessness in which the colors themselves drown, compensating the general harmony of the picture, the luminous ether in which things move forward on their own terms. In his investigation of his culture's indigenous heritage, Alfonso Reyes mined classic texts that chronicled the history of Latin America, including Hernán Cortés's Letters from Mexico and the true history of the conquest of New Spain by another conquistador, Bernal Díaz del Castillo. Reaching beyond Mexico City to its Aztec predecessor, the ancient city of Tenochtitlan, Reyes described a vibrant metropolis of constant movement. He sketched a portrait with the minute details of daily life, the sounds of the city, the customs of the people. La figura de Alfonso Reyes es imprescindible en la historia no nada más de la literatura mexicana, sino de la literatura continental, porque es eh, un hombre que perteneció a la generación llamada del Ateneo y que realmente, sobre todo gracias a su maestro inicial, que fue Pedro Enrique Sureña, tuvo una formación muy amplia, muy eh, universal realmente. 
Reyes possessed an extraordinary ability to bring the world of indigenous Americans to life, and his work shed light on an entirely new way of reading the American archive. This fresh vision of history would fuel the post-World War II explosion of literary output in Latin America. The phenomenon came to be known as the boom and was represented by authors such as Carlos Fuentes, Gabriel García Márquez, and Mario Vargas Llosa, among many others. This new vision of local culture was part of a larger reassessment of Latin American identity that would eventually encompass the entire continent. In this period of reflection, there arose Poesia Negra, or Black Poetry. This form synthesized elements of black and white culture, while describing both the joys and the agony of the African experience in America. The Cuban poet Nicolas Guillén experimented with meter and form to replicate the rhythms of a folk music known as son from the island of Hispaniola. Lo más importante de la poesía de Nicolás Guillén es que no toma al negro o a la negritud como tema de su literatura poética, sino realmente como voz. Y me parece que este es un salto cualitativo. Cuando Nicolás Guillén escribe algún poema en songo rocosongo que dice tamba, 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 tamba del negro que tumba, tumba del negro, caramba, caramba, que el negro tumba, ya no es el negro una presencia, un objeto de estudio eh, que muchas veces fue tomado con tintes eh, folclorizantes, sino es una voz, y esa voz es realmente muy importante. The nonfiction essay had always been an important component of Latin American literature. Writers such as Octavio Paz and Samuel Ramos in Mexico, as well as the Dominican Pedro Enrique Ureña, breathed fresh life into the genre. Ureña wanted to use literature as a prism for breaking out the meaning of the term Latin American, and offered up a series of theoretical approaches. His book, Literary Currents in Hispanic America, described the various identities that Latin American literature had produced and attempted to rescue from oblivion the language of the mestizo culture. The literary orientation of the time is Romanticism. Romanticism proposed to each nation the creation of their own style, sustained by their traditions. This was the tendency of the young writers of the Rio de la Plata and the rest of the Spanish-American countries. If their commitment was somehow not enough, it was because a style is not easily developed when led by will. As far as themes go, we could say that they undertook a methodic exploration of their own lands, the landscapes from the inaccessible Cordillera to the endless flatlands, the indigenous tradition, the colonial tradition, and between them, the collision of conquest. The cultural essay quickly became central to retelling Latin American history. The genre got a substantial boost from the Argentinian Ezequiel Martinez Estrada, an essayist known for his exuberant and emphatic prose. Through the unfolding dialectic of history, he sought out the reasons for the American present in the American past. Martinez Estrada wrote extensively about Nietzsche, Montaigne, and Kafka and examine the themes of civilization versus barbarism that had been first put forth by the influential writer Domingo Faustino Sarmiento. This framework of change and experimentation gave rise to writers who prefigured the Latin American boom. These were solitary voices, writers in search of an identity. Perhaps the most marginal of them all, set apart from modernism and the vanguards of the early 20th century, was the Argentinian novelist, playwright, and short story writer, Roberto Arlt. Arlt corta para siempre con la ensoñación romántica y la ensoñación pasa a ser eh, poblada por metáforas que provienen del mundo de la tecnología, de la informática, de los años 20, pero de la informática, de los adelantos científicos. Es decir, el imaginario de Arlt está poblado con todos los discursos de la modernidad. No hay zonas, o hay muy pocas zonas que remitan a lo anterior de la ciudad moderna. Arlt's first novel, The Angry Toy, from 1926, was dedicated to fellow Argentine and gaucho author Ricardo Juraldez. Its adolescent protagonist, Silvio Astier, hails from humble circumstances, 
Despite his low birth, Silvio cuts a heroic figure. He's one of those people for whom everything seems to come easily. Arlt's coming-of-age story was based on a serialized novel entitled The Exploits of Rocambolet by the French Gothic writer Pierre-Alexis Ponson du Terrail. Adopting Ponson du Terrail's fanciful and adventurous style enabled Arlt to fashion a tale both cynical and fantastical. His novel is an escape from the daily grind that also doubles as pointed commentary. The angry toy elicited impassioned praise from the young intellectuals of the era, who were quick to contrast it with the work of old guard writers such as Leopoldo Lugones, Manuel Galvez, and even Horacio Quiroga, a progenitor of magical realism. Meanwhile, Arlt dedicated himself to journalism, publishing his daily column, Buenos Aires Etchings, in the newspaper El Mundo, a platform that provided him with a wide public readership. This forum also enabled Arlt to legitimize a more colloquial approach to language, within the context of the increased professionalization of writing which was taking place in the 30s. My editor has asked me not to use the word beratin, pig-headedness, because the newspaper goes to families, and the word beratin might sound bad to them. But I respectfully ask permission from the ladies of the house to use the sweet and mellifluous word beratin today. The city, rife with contradictions and the displaced modernity of the continent, is omnipresent in Arlt's fiction. It even served as an agent in the act of creation itself. Arlt penned his novels, The Seven Madmen, The Flamethrowers, and Love the Magician, in the dingy bars and poverty-stricken boarding houses of central Buenos Aires. The pace and intensity of Arlt's work damaged his health, and he died young on July 26, 1942. The last article he wrote was entitled, The Landscape of the Clouds. In posterity, he has become a galvanizing figure, one who mitigates the class-conscious bias of early 20th century literature and returns literature to the people. Arlt es un inmigrante, hijo de este, gente eh, sin dinero, pero que al mismo tiempo tiene todas las oportunidades de inserción en una Argentina que está en constante crecimiento. Y es un escritor que elige una línea de creación, digamos, que de algún, en algún sentido le da la espalda a toda esa, eh, esa búsqueda estética occidental, en un sentido. Y en otro sentido, acoge todo lo que puede. Pero desde un lugar eh, salvaje, desde un lugar ingenuo. The mid-20th century was an era of large-scale migratory currents that forever altered the face of Latin American cities. This process of change also forced a reassessment of problematic issues that had persisted since Latin American countries gained independence from their colonial overlords. Issues like what constitutes a national language, what a culture can claim to be its own, and how to respond when disparate cultures come together. These tensions applied constant pressure on cultural and social institutions, tensions which were played out particularly in the schools, where personal identity is often learned against the backdrop of the larger community. Arlt's literature laid bare the contradictions, transformations, and instability that defined his times. In stark contrast stands Leopoldo Lugones, the Argentinian writer and critic who came to be known as a custodian of language. In this role, he laid claim to a notion of nationhood and national language that sprang from the mythic image of the rugged, cow-herding gauchos. Lugones inscribed national history and literature onto the rural landscape, imaginatively linking the Iliad with Martín Fierro, the famous epic poem by the Argentine writer José Hernández. Lugones put forth his ideas in a series of masterful lectures, collected in his celebrated volume El Peador, or The Gaucho Minstrel. And then there came Jorge Luis Borges. Born in 1899 in Buenos Aires, Borges would become one of the foremost literary figures of the 20th century. A wide-ranging writer and critic, he took it upon himself to distinguish the national voice from its Creole referent. In his book, The Size of My Hope, 
published in 1926. He wrote in cryptic terms about his undertaking as a writer. Brother Molcho and his successor Felix Lima are the ordinariness discussed in the suburb. Evaristo Cariego, the sadness of his disinclination and breakdown. Afterwards I came, as long as I live, there will always be someone to praise me. And I said before anyone, not the fates, but the landscape of the outlying areas, the grocery store pink like a cloud, the alleyways. Roberto Arlt and Jose Taillon are the shamelessness of the suburb, its ferocity. Every one of us has said his piece on the suburb. No one has said it in its entirety. Borges quickly became a cultural touchpoint, as well as the gold standard for legions of writers and readers. His early work was marked by the influence of Ultraism, the Spanish-born movement that put itself out as an alternative to Modernismo, the distinctly Latin American commingling of romantic and symbolist sensibilities. Success did not come immediately. Borges had to subsidize the publication of his first books of poems himself, and he would distribute his works by sneaking them in his friends' bags. His most important professional and intellectual association was with Victorio Campo, intellectual, patron, and publisher of the fabled review Sur, or South. It was in issue number five of Sur that Borges laid out a literary credo that many have interpreted as the precursor of magical realism. That was not his intention, however. What he'd meant to do was simply to come out in opposition to pure realism an aesthetic movement that was sweeping through the arts in the early part of the 20th century. In the essay, entitled Narrative Art and Magic, Borges drew a distinction between two processes of fiction. The natural, which is the incessant result of uncontrollable and infinite operations, and magic, lucid and limited, where the particulars are prophesied. In the novel, I think the only possible honor lies with the latter, let the former be for psychological simulation. In the 1940s, Borges turned out some of his most important works, The Garden of Forking Paths in 1941, Fictions in 1944, and The Aleph in 1949. His complex worldview, cosmopolitan yet lowbrow, poetic yet pedestrian, is expressed in language that is both precise and onerous en estos primeros volúmenes. Borges quiere recuperar la historia nacional, ¿no? Y ponerlo en forma escueta, ¿no? Muy, muy sintética y sincrética para la poesía. Borges es también el poeta del, del poema Reco La Recoleta. Quiere pensar la muerte, cómo, cómo la historia argentina evoluciona y se, se sintetiza en una lápida. Como una gran pregunta de Borges siempre es cómo al escribir el nombre podemos alcanzar la inmortalidad. Este es una, un leitmotiv en la obra de Borges que está ahí constantemente. I come now to the ineffable center of my tale. It is here that my writer's hopelessness begins. All language is an alphabet of symbols whose use assumes a past shared by its interlocutors. How can one transmit to others the infinite Aleph, which my timorous memory can barely contain? Borges breathed new life into the fantasy genre. He imbued it with metaphysics and granted fantasy new coordinates that altered not only the way the genre was written, but also the way it was read. The labyrinthine games and the mystical slant of his best-known stories were highly original and widely influential. Some critics have gone so far as to claim that his fiction altered the reality of literature itself. Yet Borges himself insisted that his true ambitions were modest. I do not write for a select minority, which means nothing to me, nor for that adulated platonic entity known as the masses. Both abstractions so dear to the demagogue, I disbelieve in. I write for myself and for my friends and I write to ease the passing of time. Borges was linked with a group of writers known as the Martin Fieristas, so named because they were often featured in the pages of the literary journal Martin Fierro. However, in the political realm, he found himself deeply isolated, 
Looming over his career was the commanding figure of Juan Domingo Perón, the populist Argentine leader whom Borges strongly denounced. According to the eminent critic, Emir Rodriguez Monigal, the very character of Borges' writing changed during the Perón government. The mythical element of Buenos Aires drained out of his stories, and the colorful characters and vivid locations were nowhere to be found. Lo que me parece muy notable en la evolución de Borges, ya hablo más que de su poesía, de la prosa de Borges, es que efectivamente sus textos primeros tienen que ver con los eh, arrabales, tienen que ver con los eh, gauchos, con los suburbios de Buenos Aires, eh, cuentos como El hombre de la esquina rosada, las milongas que escribió Borges para las seis cuerdas, la milonga de Jacinto Chitlán, etcétera, etcétera. Hasta que finalmente él mismo confiesa que esos textos pues ya no le satisficieron totalmente y que ya eh, de alguna forma se los había apropiado ese Borges famoso y él tenía que idear otras cosas. The classic Borges story was a mix of malice and literary mastery that united high art with popular culture. His beautifully wrought tales of troublemakers and ne'er-do-wells transcend their particulars and join the pantheon of world literature. Yet he took pains to squarely place his work in the context of a specific time and place through essays such as The Argentine Writer and Tradition or The Language of the Argentines. His essays dwelt in the metaphysical, as in his book On Eternity, Borges desde, desde muy jovencito era un filósofo del lenguaje, era un filósofo de la expresión y de la imposibilidad de ella. Y ese Borges creo que es el que da lugar al otro Borges que conocemos, esa mezcla, por ejemplo, de alta cultura con baja cultura. En eso él se adelanta a todo lo que es cultural studies, ¿verdad? Y, y, y porque él no hace una mezcla monstruosa como otros híbridos. Lo que él hace es, es demostrar cómo una cosa, volteándola un poquito, devuelve en la otra. And yet, and yet, denying temporal succession, denying the self, denying the astronomical universe are obvious acts of desperation and secret consolation. Our fate, unlike the hell of Swedenborg or the hell of Tibetan mythology, is not frightful because it is unreal. It is frightful because it is irreversible and ironclad. Time is the thing I am made of. Time is a river that sweeps me along, but I am the river. It is a tiger that tears me apart, but I am the tiger. It is a fire that consumes me, but I am the fire. The world, unfortunately, is real. I, unfortunately, am Borges. Just as long-form fiction was revitalized by the advent of the Mexican revolutionary novel, so was Latin American poetry pointed in a new direction during the mid-20th century. In this case, it was at the hands of the magnificent Mexican poet, essayist, and intellectual Octavio Paz. The sources of inspiration for his early poems varied widely, from Marxism, Surrealism and Existentialism, to the Buddhist and Hindu religious traditions. He was, however, a revolutionary to the core of his being, as he famously attested in his study of Mexican identity entitled, The Labyrinth of Solitude. It is the revolution, the magical word, the word that will change it all and that will give us a great joy and a quick death. For the revolution, the Mexican people become lost in thought, in their past and in their essence, to extract their filiation from their private life, from their core. Paz was born into turbulent times, and revolution continued to define Mexico throughout his lifetime. The Mexican president, Lázaro Cárdenas, who served from 1934 through 1940, gave new momentum to the cycle of change he implemented agrarian reform, created labor and peasant organizations, and promoted public education. Paz himself expanded his horizons, traveling to Spain to participate in a congress of anti-fascist writers 
He later was one of the founders of the journal Taillier, or Workshop, and he traveled to the United States on a Guggenheim Fellowship. He became deeply discouraged by a series of dark events. Hitler taking control in Germany, Stalin's consolidation of power in the USSR, the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War, and the assassination of the exiled Soviet communist Leon Trotsky. Paz described his political transformation in the Labyrinth of Solitude. Between 1930 and 1940, as much in Europe as in America, most of us then young writers felt a great sympathy for the Russian Revolution and Communism. Our attitude was a mixture of good feelings, righteous indignation at the injustices that surrounded us, and ignorance. My doubts began in 1939 with the signing of the German-Soviet Pact. The doubts were transformed into criticism. Many leftist intellectuals of the time rejected Paz's denunciation of far-left politics. However, in Buenos Aires, his position was well received by José Bianco and Victorio Campo. They published The Labyrinth of Solitude in the journal Sur in 1951, both as a piece of political literature and for its inherent aesthetic value. As his poems began to circulate throughout the continent, Paz became the champion of a new, eroticized strain of verse. Influenced by writers such as the Marquis de Sade and the French surrealist Georges Bataille, his work exuded a raw sensuality which he clothed in the imagery of Mexican mythology. This sensibility opened the way for an infusion of Far Eastern themes into his work. Paz had been an avid student of Buddhist and Taoist thought before setting off on extended tours to India and Japan as a Mexican diplomat. These influences brought added texture and coloration to his verses. It rained. The hour is an enormous eye. Inside it we come and go like reflections. The river of music enters my blood. If I say body, it answers wind. If I say earth, it answers where. The world, a double blossom, opens. Sadness of having come. Joy of being here. I walk lost in my own center. Another Latin American poet who did not shy away from erotic themes was the Chilean writer Pablo Neruda. Born in 1904, by the age of 20, he published an intensely erotic book of poems called Twenty Love Poems and a Song of Despair. The book was an international success. By the 1930s, he had conquered the literary world. In 1936, his more mature and ambitious book of poems, Residence on Earth, offered definitive proof that Neruda was one of the world's greatest contemporary poets. This was a time of great upheaval in the Spanish-speaking world. The Spanish Civil War broke out, and shortly thereafter, the Spanish playwright and poet Federico García Lorca was assassinated. Neruda traveled to Spain to raise money and support for the Republicans, and wrote Spain in my heart as an expression of solidarity. With the English writer and political activist Nancy Cunard, he founded a magazine called the poets of the world defend the Spanish people. In 1939, he put out a book of poems entitled Furies and Sorrows. El sujeto de, de, de las obras eh, evidentemente se preocupan por, eh, por zonas, eh, por actitudes que, eh, que varían, ¿no? por más que Eh, hay un carácter como profético que tiene la poesía de Neruda eh, o el, una, una apuesta muy fuerte a la, a la puesta en escena de todas las posibilidades eh, de la riqueza del lenguaje, ¿verdad? De, eh, de tener en cuenta eh, la musicalidad, la, eh, eh, cómo, cómo reverbera la repetición, esto Neruda nunca lo, digamos, es un poeta que eh, no, no renuncia prácticamente a nada. The Peruvian poet César Vallejo was born in a remote village in the Andes of Peru, the youngest of 11 children. In 
In 1922, he published a book of poems called Trilce, which established him as one of the preeminent poetic voices of the 20th century. He became deeply involved in the Spanish Civil War and in 1930 published Spain, Take This Cup From Me. Children of the earth, if Spain falls, I say it's a manner of speaking, if there should fall down from the sky her forearm, which is seized and pulled along by two earth-forged plates, children, what an age of sunken temples! How early in the sun what I was telling you! How soon within your breast the ancient clamor! How old you're too in the quarto! Children of the earth, here is Mother Spain with her belly on her back. Here is our teacher with her yardstick. She is mother and teacher, cross and timber, because she gave you the height, vertigo, and division, and sum. Children, it's up to her, fathers of due process. If she falls, I say it's a manner of speaking, if Spain falls from the earth downwards, children, how you are going to stop growing. In the period before the boom in Latin American literature, the field of cultural production was intensely focused on defining the role and meaning of storytelling. While poetry typically set the cultural course of the continent, this period saw an explosion of interest in the role of narrative in defining regional identity, class identity, and language. These issues were given shape by the Uruguayan literary critic Ángel Rama in his book Narratives of Transculturation, in which he calls for the alignment of literature with larger social and historical factors. For Rama, politics, prose, and the problems that defined Latin America were all inextricably linked. He plumbed the work of the Cuban anthropologist Fernando Ortiz, who had reinterpreted the dynamics of social contact and commercial production in his famous essay, Cuban Counterpoint of Tobacco and Sugar. Rama used the term narrative transculturators to identify writers who synthesized elements from familiar and foreign cultures. These are the writers who make a career out of stepping outside themselves and looking back at their world as a bemused outsider. The Peruvian anthropologist and writer Jose Maria Arguedas had one foot in white culture and the other in the traditional world of the Quechua Indians. He attempted to create what he called the opera of the poor, which portrayed society exactly as he experienced it. Yet he was confronted with enormous challenges. How do you transcribe the worldview of marginalized cultures into the idiom of the mainstream culture? How do you literally and metaphorically translate the language of subordination into the language of the dominant social force? These challenges also confronted the Cuban novelist Alejo Carpentier, who narrated the experience of Afro-American culture in a distinctly Baroque literary voice. As such, Carpentier is often cited as a herald of the Latin American boom. Yo no diría que la obra de Carpentier es fantástica. Es una obra que por lo menos no pretende serlo. Lo que pretende Alejo Carpentier es ser un escritor realista, pero considera que lo maravilloso está en la realidad. Alejo Carpentier yo creo que es un escritor eh, realmente muy importante, que de alguna forma le dio fundamentación teórica a lo que después se podría llamar el realismo mágico, eh, por cuyas veredas cada vez más pavimentadas han circulado tantos escritores. His aesthetic theory of lo real maravilloso, the marvelous real, has been interpreted by many critics as one of the origins of what came to be known as magical realism. Through his mythic and fantastical writing, he blazed new trails for the Latin American novel. Carpentier described the power of his approach in the prologue to The Kingdom of This World. The marvelous becomes unequivocally marvelous when it arises from an unexpected change in reality, a miracle, a privileged revelation of reality, from an unusual or singularly favorable illumination of the unnoticed riches of reality, from an amplification of the scales and categories of reality, perceived with peculiar intensity due to an exaltation of the spirit which takes it to a kind of limit state. 
This presence and validity of the truly marvelous was not a privilege unique to Haiti, but the patrimony of all of America, where an inventory of cosmogenies, for example, has yet to be conducted. The truly marvelous is found at every step in the lives of the men who inscribed dates in the history of the continent and who left surnames still used to this day. Carpentier professed an affinity for the Creole Baroque style expressed in what he called the immense altarpiece of columns, gratings, polychrome glass that is Havana. At the same time, his novels and short stories demonstrated a preoccupation with the musical form, with its repetition of themes and self-referential structure. As a journalist, musicologist, and art critic, he opened channels of communication between the old world and the new. Carpentier had a very important in music, and, of course, when he lives in Paris, he writes many muchos artículos atendiendo a eh, la música contemporánea, ¿no? Y escribe varios sobre, eh, sobre eh, Stravinsky, que también va a estar presente en concierto barroco, ¿no? Eh, en esas experiencias propias de lo americano, él va a, va a tener mucha importancia lo afroamericano, pero también la herencia barroca, ¿no? que indudablemente tiñe su ideología respecto de América. His first novel, Praised Be the Lord, was first published in Madrid, where he had befriended García Lorca and Rafael Alberti, the Spanish poet and member of the generation of 27. Carpentier returned to Cuba in 1933, and it was upon his reintroduction to the New World that he saw surrealism and old world culture as conventional and unimaginative in comparison to his native traditions. He published The Kingdom of This World in Mexico in 1949 and secured his reputation with The Lost Steps in 1953. Entonces es muy curioso porque el surrealismo para Carpentier primero es un signo de liberación. Él había escrito una novela prácticamente costumbrista, realista, Cuellambao, se arrepiente de haberle escrito cuando entra en contacto con el surrealismo, pero después cuando vuelve a América, más bien el surrealismo le parece obsoleto, le parece artificial, le parece decadente, y empieza entonces su gran gesta, su gran epopeya americana, que con este mismo criterio de lo real maravilloso, habrá de dar como resultado las novelas subsecuentes de Alejo Carpentier. The Guatemalan writer and diplomat Miguel Ángel Asturias also practiced literary transculturation. He turned the instability and injustice of his native country into a mythic fiction in which the marvels of nature commingle with the abuse of power, where the telling detail brings into sharp relief the harsh reality of indigenous life. His 1946 book, The President, in which he portrayed a cartoonish and grotesque dictator, lampooned the repressive rule of Manuel Estrada Cabrera. In it, he counterposed the forces of light, the people, with the forces of darkness, the dictator, using a familiar paradigm from Latin American mythology. The President is a book of militant, outraged protest that describes the atrocities of a dictatorial regime in unflinching terms. Cruelty, terror, and death suffuse the work. His mythic themes reappeared in Men of Maze from 1949. Here, light is represented by the indigenous people and darkness by the Men of Maze, the colonizers who come to exploit the peasants' lands for their own benefit. In this work, Astorias successfully joined the mythic marvelous approach with the brutal reality of life as an Indian. This motif is resurrected in his Banana Plantation trilogy, which was, in essence, a literary crusade against foreign exploitation of Guatemala. The novels in this series were Strong Wind, The Green Pope, and The Eyes of the Interred. Asturias, who was awarded the 1967 Nobel Prize in Literature, believed that, quote, the novel is the only means of making the world know the needs and aspirations of the people to which it belongs. On the border between Argentina and Uruguay, framed by Buenos Aires and Montevideo, 
is the Rio de la Plata region of South America. The estuary, formed by the combination of the Uruguay and Paraná rivers, has a long indigenous and colonial history. It also possesses a literature of its own. Among its purveyors is Julio Cortázar. Born in Brussels of Argentinian parents, he arrived in Buenos Aires at the age of four. A sickly child who was a voracious reader, he fell in love at an early age with the science fiction of Jules Verne. He worked as a school teacher and then as a professor, and in 1938 published a small book of sonnets entitled Presence, written in the style of Stéphane Mallarmé. In 1949, he published a play called The Kings, which was based on the myth of Theseus and the Minotaur. An avid anti-Peronist, he left his country in 1951 to work as an independent translator for UNESCO in Paris. In that same year, he published Bestiary, the book that set the tone for what would become his characteristic style. Fantastical and funny, Cortázar's work drew back the curtain on reality to reveal its rickety metaphysical superstructure. And in that uncertain place is where he sets his stories. No se puede hablar de un Cortázar enterito, ¿no? Y, y los cuentos indudablemente son en la línea de la literatura fantástica, aparece la influencia de Borges, o sea, toda una tradición. Y la narrativa es lo que se llamaba en ese momento experimental, o sea, eliminar todo lo que la novela realista había acostumbrado al lector. ¿no? Tenemos eh, textos en donde no sabemos quién es el narrador, mezclas de tiempo, mezclas de punto de vista, eh, perspectivas que obligan al lector a trabajar y ver cómo entiendo esto porque es, nadie me lo está explicando claramente, ambigüedades, tiempos verbales cambiados, fragmentos torcidos, es decir, todo lo que pueda representar un experimento con respecto a la narrativa tradicional. ¿no? Between the last spoonful of rice pudding, a pity there was too little cinnamon, and the kisses before going to bed, the bell in the phone room rang and Isabel lingered until Inez came from answering it and whispered something in her mother's ear. They looked at one another and then the two of them looked at Isabel, who thought about the broken cage, the multiplication beads, and a little bit about Miss Lucera being angry because she had rung her doorbell on her way home from school. She was not very worried. Her mother and Inez were looking beyond her, almost using her as a pretext. All the same, they were looking at her. Also active during this period was the writer Silvina Ocampo. She was married to the noted author Adolfo Bioy Cesares, friends with Jorge Luis Borges and sister of Victoria Ocampo a noted intellectual and publisher of the journal Sur. Living in the shadow of these larger-than-life figures, she wrote stories and poems and painted watercolors, works that did not make an impact during her lifetime. However, in later years, praise of her limpid prose had steadily grown, and today she is considered one of the most significant female writers of 20th century Latin American literature. Her stories, Forgotten Voyage from 1937 and Autobiography of Irene from 1948, are the work of an enfant terrible who is firmly established in, and tweaks the nose of, the Argentinian patrician class. The Uruguayan writer Juan Carlos Onetti was, by contrast, a high school dropout who dwelled at the fringes of society. He created a Rio de la Plata style of fiction that trafficked in the marginalized folk of the city, giving rise to a literature without edges, where identities convulse and intermingle. Fellow writer Carlos Fuentes wrote that, quote, Onetti's novels and stories are the foundation blocks of our modernity. He gave all of us, his descendants, a lesson in narrative intelligence, in wise structure, and an immense love for the literary imagination, unquote. Es un escritor que apuesta por la fundación de un mundo personal, digamos, eh, ficcional, eh, a la manera de Proust o a la manera de Faulkner. Y creo que en ese sentido eh, va construyendo su, su propio territorio. Y me parece que, bueno, en ese sentido hay eh, en la construcción artificial de un territorio, una subversión muy importante teniendo en cuenta que la ficción latinoamericana del periodo de los 30 
suele más bien tener que ver con una representación más regionalista o, si se quiere, realista de la cuestión territorial. Creo que el artificio de tener un territorio propio para instalar allí una ficción es realmente un estilo también. As was the case with nearly all the members of the Rio de la Plata movement, Onetti was a journalist. He served as a copy editor for Marcha, the most important Uruguayan publication of the 20th century. It was there that he published a literary column called The Puddle Stone, penning mysteries and literary gossip articles. In 1939, his first novel, The Pit, appeared, and in 1941 he published No Man's Land. Nine years later, his major work, A Brief Life, was published. This novel opened new territory in Rio de la Plata literature. In it, he created Santa Maria, a mythical city that is the spiritual capital of Onetti's narrative world. It is an uncertain place, halfway between the two shores of the Rio de la Plata. In A Brief Life, all his narrative themes converge, the dichotomy between identity and the absence of identity the recurrent anxiety over the role of destiny in the lives of individuals, and the dream world as a screen for reality. All this played out in an atmosphere of eccentricity and disillusionment. This novel is considered one of the seminal works of Latin American writing. Meanwhile, I am this little bashful man, unchangeable. This little man that annoys as he causes pity a man confused in the legion of little men that were promised the heavenly kingdom. This little man, me and my taxi meter, inexistent, a mere incarnation of the idea of Juan Maria Brausen. In truth, a nobody. Latin American writers of the mid-20th century created a style harvested from the kaleidoscopic diversity of the Latin American experience a place where renowned writers could become distinguished statesmen, where the cities were vibrant and chaotic, where music was enmeshed into the rhythm of daily life. In a time of political oppression and aesthetic exhaustion, these authors and their intertwining works wove a narrative tapestry that will ultimately bring about the Latin American boom of the 1960s. Mm -hmm. 